IBM getting into <laughs> SMB with <laughs> mainframes. Come on, man. Come on. You like that one? Come on, hey, buddy. I'll tell you what. I was up all night trying to come up with cool headlines like Paul does. I'm convinced he outsources to some ad agency or something. He does Fiverr. Come on, Paul. You can admit. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So here's the deal. Um, by the way, part in the background, I'm up in Fayetteville visiting my son. So I'm sitting in my hotel room. Um, the bed is made, however. So hey, well, thank you for making it. Unlike other folks. I'm not going to call anybody's level of commitment into question, but I'll be here for you. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> All right, so here's the deal. IBM, uh, Linux One for, you know, everyone knows about of, of IBM, obviously. And while, you know, people, you, you can talk about, you know, its, its prevalence in the market relative to x86, what you cannot argue is performance, security, reliability, right? I mean, it just kills. That's why people pay a lot of money for the technology. And that's why these servers that are based on IBM technology have literally been around for decades and people and, and organizations will not move away from them. And so the question is, and, and really it's the, the Wall Streets, the highly regulated, the, where, where data really matters. Those are the folks, the companies, the organizations that are holding on to, holding on to IBM. Question is, how do you take that, all of that goodness that's in the IBM Z systems and then kind of moved into the Linux world with Linux One and make it available to the SMB space. And that is Linux One for Express. So what is it? It's taking IBM technology built on IBM Silicon, IBM platforms, the Telem AI chip, um, building out a, a software ecosystem around it and, and configuring it, packaging it and pricing it so that Organizations not named J.P. Morgan Chase, not named, you know, insert Fortune 50 company here, are able to consume this technology in an affordable way. Same platform, same capabilities, same level of performance, same level of reliability, um, same level of security, all in a smaller form factor for those digital startups, for those organizations that, um, that uh, you know, kind of envy that those capabilities, but don't have the budget to be able to start to consume. I think it's a great move. I, it, it, by the way, I am in no way suggesting suggesting that IBM is going to go in and uh, start replacing HPE and Dell at every SMB organization out in the world. But I do think organizations that have, you know, I've, I've been in IT and you have the IBM side of the house and you have the, you know, the x86 side of the house. I think those organizations, they're very ripe for this Linux One 4 Express um, to start deploying. It's, you know, you interface it just like you would any Linux OS and like any Linux console. The applications are all, it's Red Hat and, you know, the open source community kind of embracing it. It's a really good play. Um, and, and while I, again, while I don't think short term, you're going to see every cloud native company start employing Linux One, I think longer term, you're starting to see IBM shift, you know, shift in its capability to serve that lower end of the market, down market, if you will, um, without sacrificing any of its the quality of its product, um, but doing so in a way that's profitable for them and, and uh, affordable for customers. Hey, Matt, do you think, uh, I mean, this seems like a cloud play where, mm -hmm. you know, you've got this uh, amazing, incredible expensive uh capability um i mean it just it doesn't break right uh it seems like this would be perfect for like a like a cloud implementation where you get basically access to the consoles like you would at an aws yeah it, it's funny because they they play this as their hybrid cloud platform a hybrid cloud platform i should say um and ai but it is very much like a, this to me, Pat, whenever we talk about, you know, the abstraction of technology from kind of outcomes, this to me is the living proof of, of that concept, right? Yeah. You're absolutely right. You know, IT consumers, business users, you know, the kind of the DevOps folks that are just looking for resources, 
they can go in. Um, they're able to access this like they would, you know, any server that they have in the past. The management of the underlying technology is abstracted from everybody. It's deployed and supported by IBM partners or IBM itself. Um, so it, it absolutely is kind of the, it's the, it is to me kind of the cloud coming to the, uh, the on-prem data center. Um, it, and I really like how they leverage that Red Hat acquisition and all of the IP, um, you know, from the OS, from RHEL to OpenShift, making this and, and creating the connectivity between these platforms in public clouds, whether it's IBM Cloud, AWS, Azure, OCI, um, they make it seamless and frictionless. And again, it, it's a it's it's introducing that enterprise technology without having to have those really expensive resources, people resources, to deploy, manage, and, and maintain on a day-to-day -day basis. They're got offering. It. it sounds like they're they've got a pretty healthy uh, TCO. On the yeah, you know, it's funny you say that, Paul, uh, and I'm glad you brought that up. You know, they it, look, and everybody has TCO studies that are going to prove that they're the best. But, you know, when they look at um, at Linux One Express, and they have three flavors of it, small, medium, large, essentially. They look at their small version uh, relative to the equivalent x86 deployment, and they're claiming a 52% TCO savings over a five-year lifespan. Um, that includes, you know, that that's including obviously the upfront costs, the capital expense of, of, um, of the equipment. But you know, throughout the life, management, maintenance, power, all of it, um, potential security exploits, fifty-two percent savings. That's a that's a pretty remarkable savings. Yeah. What, what's the uh, cost of the entry-level platform on that? So it, the cost is one hundred and thirty-five thousand. Um, and it's a, it's for a, you know, it's, it's a, it, it is your kind of mini data center in, in a rack that gets deployed in your racks. Um, the, the, the logical question is what does that compare against on the x86 side, right? Like how many servers is that and how much storage, you, you know, what does that look like? I don't have that data from IBM yet. Um, that's what I'm waiting for mm -hmm. to kind of, cause I want to add some color to this and a, I did a blog on it. Uh, I want to do a follow-on that kind of digs deeper into the TCO. That's what I'm really interested in understanding. Like, how many servers are you replacing with that Linux 1.4 Express? Uh, and the one thing I would say to what you're asking, Paul, kind of tied to that is, you know, when we, if you've grown up in the x86 world, you think about compute and computational power in one way, right? I've got sockets, I've got cores, and mm -hmm. You know, and, and and you you have you look at things through that lens. When you look at uh, Linux One, when you look at uh, IBM Silicon technology, it's a different beast altogether. There is no apples for apples comparison um, when it comes to cores versus cores, or what IBM calls IFLs, cores and IFLs. It's a completely different beast. So I'm very hesitant to say that you know. From my, I haven't played around with it. I haven't, I haven't uh, gotten my hands on it. I'd be very hesitant myself to say that you know, uh, one one uh, low end version or the baseline version of of Linux One Express for Express would be the equivalent of say eight servers or ten servers. I just can't say that yet. Um, but I'm hoping to have that answer um, over time. And I, one last thing, I, I don't want to drag this out, but one of the things I've always been impressed with with IBM on is when they benchmark and they make claims, they are so tight on what they say and what they do because of liability and for ever, all these other reasons, they don't make claims without being able to substantiate that with a whole bunch of data on the back end that is really kind of based in reality. Their legal team there is super tight on this. So I have confidence in what they're saying. I just haven't seen it yet. So hopefully we can talk about it on the next uh, podcast.